to our next presentation fire performance of concrete structures with internal and external frp reinforcement by our speaker mark green uh, professor mark green is an aci fellow and a professor in civil engineering at quince university he studies the structural performance in the fire of concrete structures applications of fiber reinforced polymers in structures sustainable materials and buildings and best practices for working with indigenous communities he recently served as provost and vice principal at quince he is a member of eci committee 440 frp reinforcement and 260 fire resistance and fire protection of structures i'll hand it over to you yes thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction and so uh, my talk is going to i'm going to try to follow on from professor coders uh, and try not to some of the content overlaps so i'll try to that and focus on some that uh, is more additive. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of uh, the myths and some of that has and maybe emphasize something slightly uh, differently than uh, Professor Purdue did. And one of the things was well, the first one maybe pointed out about adding fuel to the fire, but it doesn't make it combustible construction. Uh, and then Uh, the second one is about the glass transition temperature. Yes, it's important, but the structure will not fail as soon as that glass transition uh, temperature. Um, and then the last thing, and this is for repair, and I think also Professor Cordue already sort of hinted at it, but, not, but that uh, um, you know one of the ways is to make certain that your original structure can carry. The service loads before you do a repair, and, and I think Professor Grudy showed about how the amount of strengthening and how you have to um, be careful with that amount of strengthening because that will affect your fire endurance. Um, and, and so one one way is to limit it uh, by making certain that you can carry the uh, service loads. But that that's a good practice, but that in amongst itself won't. Uh, you may have to do other things, such as provide fire protection or insulation. Um, so I, I think something about the combustible construction, you do have to make certain that we uh, that you uh, meet flame uh, resistance requirements. And for internal reinforcement, you will also have protection uh, from the uh, for, from the concrete cover, so so it won't combust. Um, There is a little bit of increase in in uh, adding fuel to, but it is uh, for surface mounted. If there's no protection whatsoever, but the magnitude of that is generally quite small. Um, uh, so it certainly does not turn it into combustible construction. Uh, the second one is about the glass transition temperature, and it is very important because that's where uh, really the um, It's the polymer that's binding the fibers together and making it a um, uh, and making it a composite rather than individual fibers that starts to really change the properties of the glass transition temperature, so that you start to um, uh, well, uh, in from a tensile strength perspective, it turns more into a bundle of fibers in its behavior compared to a. Uh, a product, and then from a uh, bond perspective, it's the polymer that really bonds to the concrete, etc. So those are things um, that. But we also have to remember that the FRP is not the only component uh, in the structure, and they may be affected in different ways depending upon uh, what you have. So it's important from a Performance and fire to be considering the whole member at the very least, and ideally be looking at the whole structure. Although a lot of our requirements for fire performance don't really consider the whole whole structure. So, uh, um, so I guess a little bit about the FRP uh, uh, reinforced concrete beams, and uh, uh, so this is uh, so. These had, and this is similar to what Steve uh, pointed out in his presentation. Uh, what we had 
uh, we had three hours of fire resistance, and uh, so we had about uh, 400 degrees centigrade at the bottom of the bars that were measured in the center in these tests, and so that's about 800 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, roughly. Uh, whereas the glass transition temperature was only 120 degrees centigrade, of, you know, a little over maybe 250 uh, uh, Fahrenheit, something like that. So obviously you don't get failure. This is about the pullout that we did eventually get in failure, and we actually had to increase the, after three hours, we had to increase the applied loads in order to get that failure. We had about eight inches at the end. Um, there's some more than I think more inches than I think about in metrics, but anyway. Um, and uh, and so we had about eight inches at the end where that bond was protected. And, and so Steve, uh, in his first presentation, talked a bit about that. And they, they were talking about more like 16 inches, et cetera, in some of the tests that they had. But this is more realistic exposure than what we had. I think we had about like four inches that was over top, like on a ledge, and then another four inches that was uh, insulated. So that's where we had really good fire protection. Um, but you can see that, yeah, you can exceed it, the, the glass transition temperature, as long as you don't, as long as you understand how it's going to perform. Um, and so this shows uh, a lot of this at those unexposed zones um, that we have the, the temperatures here. And so this is showing the gradient over this distance. So the, this is the 200 millimeters, which is about eight inches here. And so you can see for the, those first four inches here, we're keeping the temperatures are below about 200 degrees centigrade under about uh, um, under about 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And so the bond that we're achieving in this region is what's really anchoring those bars and making certain that we don't get failure. And so it is acting uh, uh, like a, an unbonded, uh, or a unbonded tendency that bonded that, that a cable support. Uh, you mentioned about the original structure, uh, that you're, you can do anything with your FRP and not worry about fire, as long as your original structure is okay. Uh, but it does ignore the fact that the fire affects the original structure, and uh, Dr. Cordier uh, showed quite a bit of that, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. And these are also some, some of these tests we did together, uh, I can test it myself. Um, and this shows a slightly different representation of the um, uh, uh, of of those column tests, and it shows some of the the strength and design strength, and then we have uh, the failures that we actually achieve, the loads that we actually had to apply to achieve it. And you can see even after fire exposure, in most of the cases, they well exceeded the strength and design strength. But we did have a couple of the columns where we didn't, pro so this one here, that where we actually provided no insulation whatsoever. I think, Will, that was something you really wanted to investigate for those tests. And then I, it did, they, they performed quite well. I think we got about three hours of fire insurance, but still quite a bit less than the others that lasted four, the insulated columns that lasted four to five hours, and we had to increase the load. So you can see it, it failed at a lower load. So, but you know, it might be fine for you know a two-hour fire rating or something like that. that we just worry about flame spread and things like that. Um, and once again, Dr. Cordier had similar uh, things showing about what happens. This is for uh, if you have service load and you strengthen your structure, uh, then you're you're increasing basically the expected service load because you've done that strengthening. Um, and then if you have insulation, which is shown this black curve, then the insulation protects and you have gradual deterioration. So you might have, after a fire event, like four hour fire insurance. But if you um, don't do any, any insulation and you also um, strengthen it uh, a little bit higher, you may still meet the, 
uh, that the original structure can carry the service loads, uh, but without insulation, you lose the FRP quite rapidly in its strength competition. And, and there were similar curves in bank testers, and so then it produces the fire truth. So it just shows you're not going to get equal performance just by forming that, and it could, uh, you know, it could bring you back into a, that you need more fire insurance than that. Um, so some of the, you know, future directions really to be looking more at more rational design approaches. Um, we really have to understand better the bond of the FRP to the concrete at high temperature, material tests, and the modeling that's done. And then doing some recent work in multiple hazards, you know, fire and corrosion, fire and earthquake. Uh, with some of the rational procedures, this shows a little bit about um, that there are some new ACI provisions in the code, and this is in uh, an annex to the code. It talks about uh, some of the things you can do to meet fire insurance, despite it not uh, being formally recognized in the code. Um, uh, but it does give a little more information, and this is talking about making certain that you have cool, um, you know, cool cooler zones uh, where you have fire protection. And what is noted here, these are ways of maybe thickening or insulating at the ends. Um, uh, and, but these are cases where you don't have enough embedment. So if you if you're going over the support by, say, six or eight inches, you probably, you probably don't have to do anything here. You don't have to thicken. You don't have to think. Might, although we included these, these are really that you don't have to do that. To get, if you can get your anchorage another way, you don't have to do these. But if you, if you don't have uh, much embedment into a, a support or a column, then these are other ways that you could uh, still achieve, achieve the fire insurance. And that's sort of understanding that bond and, and performance. Um, and we have done more uh, work to look at the bond of the FRP with longer uh, bonded lengths. And these are some of the types of tests, developing new tests all the time to see. So we're looking at uh, longer embedment here. And so we're uh, comparing, you know, what happens uh, when you have uh, uh, longer tests uh, versus uh, uh, shorter bond lengths, and we still got some very good performance. Uh, so these are ones that show uh, the long versus the short embedment, and that you, you you don't. It's not as if providing you know twice as long gives you twice as much strength, but you still get better performance if you have a longer. Embedment. And we looked at various gradients. Um, uh, on, along the bond length, etc. Once again, there's more detail in the papers, but this shows, uh, you, and you can see here visually as well, so you can see this is where the FRP is affected most, and then back here it's not. And so these are, these are exposed, that's 120 degrees centigrade, so that's about, you know, 250 degrees Fahrenheit at the Uh, and then we've done work with uh, Turkey looking at, uh, you know, fire and earthquake and then, uh, looking to see what the performance uh, was. And we got some quite interesting and useful uh, results uh, after that and then looking at the uh, performance. Uh, and we found still after, you know, we did different amounts of fire exposure and we found still quite good performance seismically after that. These were for... Uh, just uh, regular columns, but we're also interested in looking, well, okay, if you had an FRP repair in column, then what would you, you know, and consider these different effects, what could you do? Um, and we're looking at fire and corrosion, so it looks like it might be FRP, but these are more of the tanks for looking at uh, uh, corrosion. And so what we're looking at uh, here is we're studying more uh, the effects of corrosion and how that corrosion will affect the fire performance. This is just a regular reinforced concrete structure, no FRP as such. But then what we're looking at, well, if you have a corroded structure and you want to maybe 
repair it and also make certain you have adequate fire performance. You know, how do you take into account these intersecting things? Because that's going to be a lot of the stuff that happens when you want to repair a structure. And you're repairing it because it's good. Um, and so we're looking at some of the mechanics, looking at, you know, the bond uh, of corroded steel at high temperature, um, well, corroded first and then exposed to high temperature, to understand as, as some of the tests we're doing now. So, um, but I didn't want to take up too, too much time, and, uh, but I'm happy to ask questions. But basically is that, you know, we know that we have enough knowledge with FRP to know that we can design this uh, uh, safely where in conditions where you need fire performance. Um, Class transition temperature of the polymer is very important and it, it governs a lot of the performance of the FRP, but it doesn't tell the whole story when you're talking about the performance of members or of an overall structure as well. Um, and we do need to consider, you know, how, how the uh, material does affect uh, the performance, particularly understanding the bond. Uh, more rational methods are, are needed for doing these things. And lots of acknowledgments for all of us, students, collaborators, etc. Um, and 